All right, so if you remember a while back, we went through uh, Revelation chapter 2 and 3 with the he that overcometh, and, and you know, I kind of explained a lot about that. And, and I've just been, for some reason, it's been focused. I've been wanting to preach on these passages more for a while. Of course, I've been out for a couple weeks, a couple Sundays. So um, I've been really looking forward to, to preaching through this. And this is going to be uh, a series that I'm going to be doing. And, and I don't know exactly which services or whatever we're going to get through all this. kind of just depends on, on what, uh, what I feel like preaching on on any given Sunday. But we are going to go through all of these. And I don't, you know, this morning what we're doing is, uh, and, and what the series is going to be is on the seven churches of Revelation is what I'm calling it. And basically in chapters two and three, you see these letters that John, you know, in chapter one, John has this vision and he, and he sees the Lord Jesus Christ and he has this conversation with him. And then in chapters two and three, he's basically being instructed to write these letters unto these seven churches that literally exist during this time. And we're going to see that. We're going to flip back to Revelation one. We're going to look at that just to get the context of chapter two. Chapters two and three, you get these letters being written and they're going to be sent out and they're told, you know, hey, you know, these letters that are written to these churches, you guys all basically are supposed to share them and they're all supposed to kind of read, even though they had specific messages for each of the churches addressing each of their problems and their and also the things are doing well. So what, what I want to do is go through and we're going to examine one by one each church. Now, I may or may not preach an entire sermon for, you know, each individual church. It kind of depends on the content, but like this morning, we're going to be focusing just on the church at Ephesus. So that's going to be an entire sermon just based off of this one church and the things that God is instructing for the church at Ephesus. Now, the reason why this is, why well, I think this is extremely important is because these are all instructions for churches. And there's warnings about not following these instructions for the church, which basically the Bible says they're going to lose their candlestick. So they're going to lose their place in God's eyes as being this legitimate church, right? God basically uses these churches and, you know, using a candlestick and a light makes a lot of sense because the house of God is supposed to be a place where the believers come together and they're shining forth the glorious light of the gospel and they're doing the works of the Lord. And so they're represented as these candlesticks that are supposed to be shining this light that are not supposed to be kept under a bushel, right? They're supposed to be doing these great works and, the light's supposed to shine, and he's basically warning them, saying, you know what, you're going to lose your place if you don't get this stuff under control. So the same things that were problems for churches back then can also be problems for churches today. So we want to examine, and what we're going to do is I'm going to take the time and examine all of the good things, all the things that God is commending these churches for, and we're going to look at that so we could understand, hey, these are great things. This is what we need to be doing. They're doing these things. God is congratulating for doing these things and, and, and recognizing, hey, I like that you're doing this stuff. And then there's other stuff where he's saying, look, you need to get this right. And we want to look at that stuff as well so that we don't fall into any of the same problems or traps that these churches had. So these are all going to be good for us to learn from and look to because I want our church to be a great church. I want our church to be one that God is using mightily, that we've got a candlestick in God's eyes and we've got this light that's going to shine and that our church can be used greatly of God. And I don't want to be in a condition where God's going, you know, you better watch out. You know, you better repent. You better change because... Otherwise, I'm going to remove your candlestick. And that would be a terrible place to be in. Because then, I mean, think about this. How, how vain would that be and useless if you're going to a church where God doesn't even recognize you as being a church? You know, we're commanded not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. We're commanded to come together. But if, it, if you're going to a place and, and you're taking the time out of your day, out of your week, and, and you're investing it, and you're thinking you're doing something good and something right, and, and you're going somewhere where God's just like, I, I don't even consider you a church. Like how, how meaningless and how worthless would that be to be in that state? So we don't want to be in that condition and in that state. And obviously, God feels that way about some churches. So let's, we're going to dig in and look at this and see. Now, before I even get into Ephesus, because that's the first church that's addressed, I kind of want to take a little bit of time, not too much, just a little bit of time uh, explaining further 
that these are just for, legit, for, for real churches at that time. Look at verse number 12 in um, Revelation chapter 1. Because we're just going to get the context of what's, what's going on in chapters 2, since we just read all of chapter 2. Verse number 12 says, And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girl. So this is, this is what John is seeing. So he hears this voice, and when he turns to look at the voice, he sees seven golden candlesticks, and right in the midst of those seven candlesticks, he basically sees the Son of Man. He sees Jesus Christ clothe the garment down his foot, right? That's what he sees. And then jump down to verse number 19, because then Jesus here is going to explain what he saw. And he says in verse 19, Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. Now, the things that thou hast seen, of course, he's going to see even more as you read through the book of Revelation. So now he sees the golden candlesticks, but later on he's going to be caught up in spirit to, uh, to heaven, and he's going to see a bunch of stuff in heaven. He's going to see visions of future events as well. So he's telling them, I want you to write down the things that you see and the things which are, and I believe the things which are, are the things which are now, which are these letters to the churches, and then the things which shall be hereafter, which is later on in the book of Revelation, as you continue to read, you know, with the six seals and all the other things that are going to happen that, that, are, that haven't happened yet. So uh, that's what he's being instructed. He's going to write all this stuff down. And then verse 20 says, The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks. And I was going to explain this vision. And this is what I love about the Bible, right? Um, you can find a lot of symbolic meaning in parables and stories, various places throughout the Bible. You can, you can see some truths that are contained in Scripture, but we always need to be careful with how we find that sim symbolism that we can uh, support the symbolic meaning as being true from other places in Scripture. Now, um, and what I mean by that is you already establish some kind of truth from very clear statements in Scripture. And then you can see sometimes those truths being symbolized in other areas, but we don't come up with this is a truth because it's symbolized this way here. No, the truth is settled through very clear statements in Scripture. And then you can go on further to see, oh yeah, I can see how it's symbolized. And uh, you know, because there is a lot of symbolism in Scripture, but what I love is, is that the places where it matters most with symbolic meanings, especially in the book of Revelation, it's going to be explained. And when you read through the book of Revelation, John sees these visions, and then he gets the explanation from somebody. So like when he's in heaven, he's, you know, he's like, hey, do you know what these things are? And he's like, I don't know what these things are. You're showing them to me, right? And then he gets the explanation. Now, <laughs> It's funny because especially in the book of Revelation, probably more than any other book of the Bible, since it deals with future events, people think they have a lot of liberty to start just explaining, oh, this is this and this is that, and they'll just go on and on and on talking about how this really means this and give all these symbolic meanings to try to apply them to the current day in everybody's situation. Now, I'm not saying you can't ever do that. But what I'm saying is that when you have when you have visions in Scripture and then those visions are explained, you can't take those visions and start applying them different ways than the way they're explained in Scripture. And people do that. You say, like, well, Pastor, who, lots of people do that. They do that all the time because they prey on people's ignorance that they don't actually read the Bible in context. Because they just go to somewhere and say, see, look, this is in the Bible. And they'll pull out a passage where it's talking about the great red dragon or it's talking about this, that. And they're going to say, see, this is talking about Osama bin Laden or this is talking, you know, it's like, no. It tells you exactly what it's talking about. It tells you he's talking about Satan or the Antichrist or whatever, you know, whatever the context is. He's going to explain that to you. And when he sees these visions, they're being spelled out and explained. So you can't just go and run with this stuff um, and just make up whatever you want. Like these, these seven stars and seven candlesticks, you can't just say, well, I think that the candlesticks mean this, and I think that... You can't do that because he says right here in verse 20, he says, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. So what are the stars? 
The angels of seven, are they something else? No, they're the angels of the seven churches. And the seven candlesticks, which thou sawest, are the seven churches. So he's got stars, he's got candlesticks, you've got the angels, and you've got the churches themselves. Now, that's fact. I mean, this, this is being explained from Jesus Christ himself to John, who's giving us this revelation. He's writing down these things. I want to point out that these things that John is seeing are churches, right? They're churches. He doesn't say they're church ages. He doesn't say these are periods of time that the world is going to go through in the future. He says these are churches. Because that's what they are. Because when he's writing these things down, he's literally writing them down and sending off a letter to be delivered to the church that exists at Ephesus. And then there's a church that's in Smyrna and they're going to get a letter. And there's a church in Philadelphia and they get a letter. And all of the churches that are listed here in chapters 2 and 3 receive a letter. This isn't like Back to the Future and Marty's writing a letter to uh, Dr. Brown in the, in the future that he's going to get from the 1800s or something, right? This is, that's not what this is talking about. Okay, John's not writing these letters off to, to the church age in Laodicea and now someone finally, hey, we just got this letter today. That's not what's going on here. I know I'm kind of making light of this, but the, the doctrine I'm talking about is this dispensationalist doctrine that tries to teach that these are um, church ages and they spend so much time focused on that, they, they miss, I think, all of the importance of these letters. Just focused on that as being some age. It's like, no, 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 there's actually a lot to learn here when you actually apply it to church. When you apply it to a specific real church. How about starting applying it to your church and looking at what God is saying here as good things and bad things within church. Let's focus on that instead of worry about being, you know, describing some age or something. Because then what happens if you're looking at it as ages, what are you going to care about? You're going to care about the age you're in, right? And you're going to forget about all the other ages in the past because, oh, if, well, if these are describing ages, well, what age are we in now? Oh, it's a lukewarm age. It's an age where people don't really care about much. Oh, yeah, see that going on. And then what? You miss, you miss so much. Um, and anyways, I'm not just saying that, that the, the, the doctrine is wrong because I don't like the, the end result of it. It's the doctrine is just wrong because it's wrong. <laughs> it's just incorrect. It's not, it's not what's going on here because we get the definition and the explanation of what he's seeing here. He's seeing seven churches and he sees uh, the seven stars. It says are the angels of the seven churches. Now that word angels there, again, this, you, can, you can get this context from Scripture, but in general, the word angel itself means messenger. That's what the word literally means. And you're going to see, as if you do a word study on angels throughout Scripture, that that word can be applied to human beings as well as supernatural beings. Right? The word angels, we, we commonly think of angels as being, you know, like these creatures with wings and, and things like that, that the people, you know, maybe creatures that the Bible refers to more as like seraphim or teraphim and things like that, cherubs. That's what people commonly will think of as angels. But angels can be applied, you know, the, Jesus Christ is referred to as an angel. And what the angels of the seven churches are here are the pastors or the elders. And it makes sense. If, if you're getting a letter, if you're going to send a letter to someone who has anything to do with the operation and what's going on in church, who are you going to send that letter to? Who's the one responsible for the administration and for how the church is being run within a church? It's going to be the elder. It's going to be the pastor. It's going to be the bishop of that church who's going to receive this information and say, okay, we're doing this good. We're not doing this. We need to make some changes here because he's got the authority to make those changes. And that makes the most sense. It's going to be sent to those angels. I mean, it, it wouldn't make sense if this was talking about supernatural beings, even, let's say, behind the scenes. Like, we've got these supernatural beings, angels being sent. Well, you're not going to send them a piece of paper. Where, you know, they're going to have to get the message some other way. I don't know exactly how they get their messages, but, you know, you're not going to, how, how are you going to deliver it to a supernatural being? Like, where's their mailbox, right? How are they going to receive that? This is something that's, that's literally happening. So we don't need to get hung up on, well, it says the angels of the seven churches. Yeah, because they're the messengers. They're the ones, they're the ones who are 
in that position of authority within the church to make sure things are going well. So uh, again, not, not anything to be too confused over. It just makes a lot of common sense that that's what it's talking about here. Um, Yeah, I've got some more notes on the church age thing. I don't want to spend too much more time on that, but basically, you know, <laughs> if, if this was just talking about ages in specific period of time, because they're going to say, well, the Ephesus period of time, and I was, first of all, I don't know if I've ever seen exactly, like, where are the cutoff dates between these ages? And how does that work? How do you transition from an age to an age where you go from, you know, Ephesus... And, and they, never, they never explain all of that because they just want to focus on Laodicean because that's the easiest one for them to say, oh, yeah, you people are all just a bunch of lukewarm, whatever, and, uh, and no one really cares to do anything. But we're not in, in any real different times. People are still people. Sin is still sin. You're going to have the same sins present today as you had back then. You're going to have, I mean, human nature hasn't changed. It hasn't gotten any better. And I don't think it's gotten any worse either. I think human nature is human nature and people do sinful things as they've always done, which is why the Bible is a timeless book. But um, if they were, you know, church ages, then why would John write a letter and send it off to a literal church at that time for something that's going to happen way in the future? Right? Like, why would he send the church of Laodicea the letter he sent them? If it's like, oh, but that's not for the age to come like way, way, way later. And wouldn't he just send the same message then as he did to Ephesus to all the churches? Like, why wouldn't they just all get, hey, this is the age we're in right now, so you're all going to get this one message because that's what applies to you today. It, it wouldn't, it just, the whole thing doesn't really make sense. Or, or how does an entire age lose a candlestick? Like, you know, an age is going to be 500 years or what, whatever they say. I don't even know. You know, different ages may last different. Other. It's like, Okay, this church screws up, and now, sorry, the whole age just lost its candlestick. It, it makes no sense. It, I mean, it, you can't follow this stuff through. It makes, it makes zero sense. So um, that's why we don't believe that stuff here. But anyways, let's get in. Instead of talking about what the Bible doesn't teach, let's talk about what, let's just look at what it actually is teaching. I mean, I bring up what it doesn't teach because it's a, it's a very popular doctrine. The dispensational theology is, is very common among Baptists, especially. So I bring it up for that reason, but I don't want to spend too much time on that because it's going a little bit outside the scope of the sermon, and there's a lot to learn from Ephesus. So let's go to Revelation chapter 2. We're going to look at verse number 1. And you're going to notice this, first of all, through all of the, the chapters 2 and 3, when each church is addressed, you're going to see, to start off, unto the angel of the church of Ephesus, or unto the angel of the church. Every single one starts off to the same. It's being addressed to the angel of the church. And then it also has the same exact pattern of starting off with, I know thy works. I know thy works. I know thy works. So how is God judging? Because what is he doing? He's judging churches. He's judging the value of the church. He's judging how good is this church. He's judging the church by their works, by their actions, by what they're doing. He's not judging them by their heart. He's not judging them by their feelings, by their emotions. He's judging them by their works. So if you want to be in a good church, you better be, first of all, in a church that's doing works, that's doing something. It's not just a place that you show up to and nothing's being done. It's not just a, 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 you know, a club that we just go, go and hang out and have a social gathering and then just go home. Look, if you've got no works, then God's going to be like, there's nothing even to judge. And that, how, are you, how could you possibly think you have a legitimate candlestick in God's eyes when he can't even judge your works because you're not even doing anything? He says, I know your works. They don't exist. Every single church in God's eyes are judged based on their works. Let's start reading here in verse number one. The Bible says, Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand. The seven stars are the seven angels, right? Think about that. God's got the churches that he considers churches. He's got the angels or the elders or the bishops in his right hand. 
who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. Verse number two, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not and hast found them liars and hast borne and hast patience and for my name's sake hast labored and hast not fainted. Now, so far, this is a good report. These are all positive things being brought up. Their work, their labor, they're not tolerant of evil people. They're outing false prophets. They're doing all this good work. So I'm, we're going to take some time now and we're going to dig into each one of these things that he brings up that's good. We're going to also get into what's bad that comes up soon. But these are all things that God is pointing out in a positive light. These are things that a church ought to have. As I mentioned right, work and labor. Right? We ought to have work and labor. People ought to be laboring for the Lord. We ought to be doing good work. How about this, though? Thou canst not bear them which are evil. You can't bear it, right? It means you can't stand it. You know what that means? You're not tolerant of them which are evil. How else are you going to interpret you can't bear those that are, that, that are evil? You can't stand them. Intolerance of those that are evil. We need to get back. We need a culture shift going back to saying we will not tolerate evil people. Amen. Now, this isn't saying just, well, we're all sinners, so we're all evil. No. No, there's a difference. Read the Bible. Read the Scripture. Get the understanding. When the Bible's talking about evil people, it's talking about wicked, evil people. Of course, everyone is a sinner and nobody's perfect in God's eyes. We know that. God knows that. But when God's calling out evil people or wicked people, and I've got some examples here, and this is something that's taught throughout Scripture, there needs to be intolerance. You know, when God calls something an abomination, I think it's a pretty good place to say, let's not be tolerant of things that God holds as abominable, as extremely hated. We shouldn't tolerate that. When you start getting in this culture of tolerance, you're not going to have the proper response to wickedness, to evil, wickedness, wicked sins. What, and, and mark my words, this is already happening. We have a culture that embraces tolerance as a virtue. And, you know, in some areas, tolerance is okay. It is a virtue. But when you start applying that to wickedness and wicked people, it becomes bad really fast really fast. We've got a culture now that wants to just soften consequences for wicked people. I mean, how about, you want to talk about tolerance, you've got someone who's, who defiles children, a pedophile, that barely gets any punishment at all for his crimes when the guy ought to be put to death. He ought to lose his life. But people become so tolerant of this stuff and say, oh, well, no, maybe we just, you just need to help him or we just need to put him on a list. We don't, don't do that anymore as he destroys a, 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 a child's life. I mean, if we can't protect some of our most uh, helpless people in our society, what type of society are you going to become? When you can't take care of predators? Or how about when you, when you can't protect the unborn? And you just completely tolerant. Yep, yeah, it's okay to murder, to murder a baby before it's born. That's okay. It's wickedness. Amen. And the people who perform that are wicked people. They're evil people that are putting people to death. Right. You know, we ought not to tolerate that and just be like, oh, well, it's okay. Like, it's no big deal. I can't stand them. And you ought not to be able to either. You ought to have righteous indignation and righteous anger against them. And a good church is not going to be able to bear them which are evil. I've got some examples in Scripture talking about the same type of thing. Psalm 119, verse 115, the Bible says, Depart from me, ye evildoers, for I will keep the commandments of my God. It's an attitude of having, look, I don't want to have evildoers in my presence. I want them to depart from me. I want them gone. We're not going to stand you. This isn't a church that says everybody welcome. Okay, we, extremely wicked people, evil people, or bad people out there that are out trying to hurt others and, and out plotting and planning to hurt people. They're not welcome here. Predators are not welcome here. Psalm 101, verse 4, the Bible reads, 
A froward heart shall depart from me. I will not know a wicked person. I don't want to know them. I don't want to get to understand them and try to tolerate why are they so wicked and say, oh, well, you don't understand because this happened and that happened. Look, a wicked person's a wicked person. I don't want to have anything to do with them. I'm not going to know them. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Talk about churches that need something like this. You, God points this out as being a positive point for Ephesus that they can't bear them which are evil. Churches ought to have standards. If you're going to meet in the house of God, if, you're gonna call, if God's going to look at you and say, yes, you are a candlestick, you, have, you are in a position of being a legitimate church in my sight, you're a church that I'm going to use, it needs to be a church that's going to follow his words and not bear them which are evil and not just allow anything to go on in the, in the house of God. The Bible says that the house of God, things ought to be run decently and in order. That this isn't a free-for-all. This isn't a circus. This isn't just a place for anyone to just come in and think they can do whatever they want and, and, and spread whatever filth and perversion they want. No. Things are going to be run a certain way in the house of God. And you know what? In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, we actually have rules governing how churches ought to be run, especially when it comes to evil people. Verse number 11, the Bible reads, But now I have written unto you not to keep company. How about not to bear with someone? Not to hang out with them. Not to keep company. If any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner with such an one know not to eat. And you know what the first Corinthians is? It's a letter to the church at Corinth. There's more instructions for a church, right? We're looking at the instructions for churches in Revelation. Ephesus is doing a good job of not bearing them which are evil. But we see another admonition to the church at Corinth where the Apostle Paul's writing to him and going, hey, look, if you've got someone that's called a brother, you've got someone in church, because this could be saved people, can do evil things and be considered wicked people. If they're a fornicator or covetous, they're an idolater, they're a railer, they're a drunkard or an extortioner, he says, you know what, don't even have anything to do with those people. If you can't even go out to eat with that person, what do you think that means about them being allowed in church? It means they're not. It means they're not welcome. Verse 12, for what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within? He's saying, don't you? Oh, isn't that judgmental? You better believe it is. Paul's saying, don't you judge them that are within? We're supposed to judge. We're supposed to judge. If, look, if, if people are, are if, if someone's called a brother and they're living in fornication, that's wickedness and that is not tolerated in the house of God. Amen. It's not. You're called a brother. Oh, hey, Brother Devin, he comes up and he reads the scripture before church. And, and Brother Devin's going out and getting drunk every weekend. Look, you're a drunkard. You're not going to be welcome here. And I'm not saying that, that Brother Devin is. It's an example, right? These are examples. This is, these are not just examples. These are rules that, that are given to the church. Now, look, you need to have these standards because this is a place where we all come together and we're supposed to be learning. We're supposed to be teaching our children. You know, and the children are just like, oh, look. This, these people are just living in fornication. They're not married and they're living together and doing whatever married people do together and everyone's just pretending like it's just fine and everyone's just tolerant of it. Well, you know what? We ought not to be tolerant of it. We're not going to tolerate it. There's going to be some, some uh, repercussions and when it comes to the church, it's going to be, you're not welcome here. Don't call me up to go out and hang out and get a bite to eat. I don't want to have anything to do with you until you get right with God. And that's the key. Right? It's not just this eternal judgment that once a person falls into one of these categories that you can just never, ever talk to them again. This is a form of discipline and judgment until they repent and get right with God. Which is also why when we see in Revelation 2 and 3, these letters to churches, the call to action is repent. The call to action is change. Okay, look, you've got these problems. And, and let's say for Ephesus, the table were turned, and instead of it being a good thing that they can't, can, they can't bear those that are evil, it was they're tolerant of them that are evil. Well, what would God say? He'd say, well, repent, get that right. You need to get this area right. 
And for churches who are not following 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and these rules for church, they need to repent and get that right. Verse 13 says, But them that are without God judge it, therefore put away from among yourselves that wicked person. And this is talking about a brother that's guilty of one of these sins, that's involved in one of these sins. So put away from yourself that wicked person. Look, that's what the Bible says. I didn't make that up. I'm not interpreting and giving you my, what I think about this. This is, this is what the Scripture says. It's calling that person a wicked person. And we're not supposed to tolerate that. Not bearing them that which are evil. And then in, back in Revelation chapter 2, you could turn, if you would, to Galatians chapter 2. We're going to go to Galatians 2 and then Matthew 7 if you kind of want to get ready. Revelation 2.2. 2. So he gives them praise for their works, their patience, their labor, right? They can't bear those that are evil. They don't have tolerance for evil people. You notice it says them which are evil. It doesn't say the things that people do that are evil. It says them. It's talking about the people. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars. So it looks to me that God's happy that he has a church here that's judging people who call themselves apostles and trying them, that means testing them, and has found these people to be liars and calling them out and, and basically exposing them and having nothing to do with them either, people who are false apostles or false brethren or false prophets. And again, this is another concept that's not found only here in Revelation 2. It's found elsewhere in Scripture. Galatians 2 verse 4, the Bible reads, and that because of false brethren, unawares brought in, who came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage, to whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. So this church in Galatia, they had a problem in their church with people bringing in work salvation. This is a church the Apostle Paul and other disciples went out. They preached the gospel to. They got a bunch of people saved. They start this new church in Galatia. And now he write, you can read through the whole book of Galatians and it covers the problems that are going on there and how people are trying to bring, well, you need to be circumcised in order to be saved and all this other nonsense that adding works to the, to the free gift of salvation. And what he's saying here is that there are false brethren, right? People who called themselves, they say, oh, no, yeah, we're saved, we believe. They come in, they came in privily or privately to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus. That sounds like they came in for a specific purpose, right? They came in under the radar to cause problems, okay? These people exist, and... and Oh, you sound paranoid, Pastor Bersons. Who would ever want to do that? Well, look, these warnings are riddled throughout the Scripture. Okay, and we're going to look at a couple of them. But again, this is, this is truth. This is, this is uh, important information that we need to understand as a church. I don't care if you want to call me paranoid. I don't, I don't think this is paranoid. I think this is what the Bible is teaching here and explaining that there are bad people that will try to creep into churches. There are false brethren. There are people who work for the other side, right? Children of the devil that don't like churches doing good work and laboring for the Lord and winning people to Christ and doing the good things that God has for them. People who hate God. People who don't want to see churches succeed. They want to destroy churches. They want to sow discord. And they want to try to bring in heresy and false gospel, false doctrine, and add works to salvation. Look, we need to be ready and prepared to deal with people like that and not just be tolerant of that either. And not just, oh, okay, well, that's just fine. No, it's not just fine. False brethren need to be called out and exposed and marked and avoided. It says, because of false brethren unawares brought in, people didn't know, like they came in, and look, this is going to happen, and it's going to happen from time to time, but we need to realize it's going to happen and watch out for the people who come in, it says that they might bring us into bondage. And look at it, it says in verse 5, I love verse 5, to whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour. As soon as they caught wind and they say, oh, this is what you believe, oh, this is what you teach, 
They're not being in subjection to them. They're not saying, oh, okay, well, see what you can teach me. They're saying, no, we're not giving you place, not even for an hour. And he says uh, that the truth of the gospel might continue in you. He said, we're not going to tolerate this stuff. We're not going to tolerate these false brethren that are coming in. We're going to mark them. We're going to get them out of the church. They're not welcome here. And at the church in Ephesus, they had people showing up saying that they were apostles. You know, what's funny is that there's people today, the apostolic churches, that think that they have apostles today, which, you know, the criteria for being an apostle needs to, seen, means to mean that you have seen the resurrected Jesus Christ bodily. And I'm not going to go in and, and, and teach that exactly from Scripture. You could, you could go up and, and look that up for yourself. The Bible says that the Apostle Paul was as one born out of due season, that he was one that, that's not even meet to be called an apostle because he persecuted the church of God, but he literally saw the resurrected Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus. He saw Jesus Christ, so he had, uh, and he also received the um, instructions from him to, um, to do the work that he was doing. So he was an apostle, but he's like the last of the apostles because he had already been seen of the other disciples and things like that after his resurrection, and then finally last of all of Paul. So, uh, anyways, I don't want to get in too far deep into that. Turn if you to Matthew chapter 7. More about exposing those that say they're apostles and are not. Again, Jesus gives this teaching in Matthew chapter 7. We're going to look at verse number 15. The Bible reads, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. So here we have another warning saying false prophets are going to try to come in. Okay? They're going to come in sheep's clothing. What does that mean? It means they're going to try to look like one of you. They're going to look like they're a brother in Christ or a sister in Christ. They're going to come in and say, oh, look at my clothing, right? See, I'm dressed right. I'm carrying my Bible with me. I I'm saying the right things. I've got the costume on. I've got the appearance going for me. But inwardly, they're ravening wolves they want to destroy. You could call me paranoid, but then you could also call Jesus a liar when he said to beware of false prophets that are out to destroy And then he says, how are we going to know them? Verse 16, you shall know them by their fruits. Now, real quickly, the Bible doesn't say here that you judge every single person, whether or not they're saved, based on how well they're following the Bible or God's word. That's not what this says. This says you're going to judge a false prophet and know who a false prophet is by their fruits. That's what this says. People take this passage here. They skip verse 15 and just jump to verse 16 and say, well, you should know them by their fruits and just apply this to see, well, who's saved and who's unsaved. It's not what this is teaching. Fruit is reproduction. Who are you bringing forth? Right? So when it comes to prophets or preachers or leaders of churches and you're looking for false prophets, you're going to look at who are their converts? Who are they bringing forth? What is the fruit? What is the fruit of their ministry? What are they doing? When we go out and knock on doors and talk to people, and you run into a lot of people that all go to, say, the same church, and none of them are saved, guess what? The odds are really, 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 really high that the leader of that church also isn't saved. Because if no one in the congregation is saved, no one, if they're all trusting in works, what do you think the fruit of that ministry is? Now, you're never going to have necessarily, you know, 100% of the people saved within the congregation, but, you know, that's how you judge, though. You're going to see, you know, people come and go, but when nobody's saved, you got a big problem there. So he says, you shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. And again, he's talking about trees and fruit. If someone's a fruit, right, that, that they're, they've been brought forth by a tree, but the fruit doesn't become another tree until it you know, falls to the ground, dies, and then 
a, a tree springs forth of that, right? So you can be a convert, you can be someone else's fruit and not yet be a tree that's bringing forth other fruit. But the, the, the prophets and the teachers, they should be to that point where they're bringing forth reproduction. And that's how you can judge them based off of their fruit. The same way if you're looking at a tree and going, oh, I wonder what kind of tree it is, and you see an apple growing on it. Well, it's pretty obvious. It's an apple tree, right? Because that's, that's what the only type of tree that's going to bring forth apples is an apple tree. And when you're looking at the reproduction of a prophet, you could say, oh, okay, well, this is good reproduction or bad reproduction, right? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. Uh, verse 18, a good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire, wherefore by their fruits ye shall know them. So Jesus gives a warning about the, about the fruit of a false prophet and watching out for them because they're going to come in sneak, you know, sneaky. They're going to come in in sheep's clothing and try to deceive people, but they actually are intent on destruction. Uh, turn, if you would, to Acts chapter 20. I'm going to read from 2 Peter chapter 2. Again, just more warnings and admonitions about false prophets and false brethren creeping in unawares. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1, the Bible reads, But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily, again, there's that word, privately, privily, they're coming in sneaky, shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction, and many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness shall they with feigned words, feigned means they're faking it, feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. And Second Peter chapter 2 goes on and on and on about false prophets, but again, it's another warning saying there's going to be false prophets among the people, there's going to be false teachers among you, watch out for them, they come in privately, they come in and they bring their, their, uh, their damnable heresies in, they try to teach a false doctrine, they try to teach um, other gospels, and uh, we need to watch out for them. And they just want to make merchandise of you. They just want to use you and abuse you. And that's what they want to do. That's an evil person. That's an evil person. Now, I'll say this. I don't think the majority of people are like that. They're not these evil people that are out in intent to destroy. But they do exist. And we need to be aware of them because they target churches. And they especially target churches that are in God's sight, a legitimate candlestick, doing legitimate work. The devil wants that work to cease, so he's going to send in his minions to, to infiltrate and to try to destroy. Acts chapter 20, look at verse number 28. The Bible says, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock. This is uh, elders of churches here being addressed in the context. Verse 28, Take heed un therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock, over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers. So he's giving them instruction. Look, you've been made an overseer. And that's what the bishop is, or an overseer. To feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. He's saying, when I'm gone, see right now the Apostle Paul is saying, basically, he's keeping them at bay. Right? But as soon as I'm gone, they're all going to start coming in and creeping in and, and trying to destroy the church. Not sparing the flock. Verse 30, also of your own selves shall men arise. He said, even from within. You're going to have people from within your church that are going to arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore, watch and remember that by the space of three years, I ceased not to warn everyone night and day with tears. It sounds to me like it's a pretty important thing to be aware of. He said, for three years, I, I did not stop to warn you about this. There's going to be these bad people creeping in. It's going to happen, so watch out. Be ready for it. And this is what Ephesus is being commended for. Hey, you found them out. You tried these apostles. They say they're apostles. They're not. They're false. You dealt with them and get rid of them. These are things that destroy churches. These are things that we need to be aware of. So those are all the good things. Now let's go back to Revelation chapter 2. We're going to look at what God has problems with the church at Ephesus. Verse number four says, nevertheless, and this is how you know that everything he mentioned prior to this was a positive thing, is because verse four says, nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee. He's saying, but even though you have all these things, 
I still have a problem with you. I still have something that you're not doing right. Because thou hast left thy first love. This is the problem that he has with this church. Now, this church, up to that point, I mean, it sounds great because he's saying, you know what? You can't bear them that are evil. You're trying these prophets. You're testing them. So you're not just allowing anybody to come in and teach and teach damnable heresy and everything else. You're testing them out and, and, doing, and being diligent about how you're maintaining your church. You, you know, you're doing these good things. You're, you're working and laboring, he says. You're doing a lot of stuff. You're doing work. I mean, there's activity going on in this church, right? These are all commendable things. But there's a big problem with the church at Ephesus. He says, because thou hast left thy first love, remember therefore from whence thou art fallen and repent and do the first works. So the first love and the first works, I believe are synonymous or tied together there. Or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. They've got all this other good stuff going on. They're missing one thing that is extremely important. It's so important, he says, if you don't get this fixed, I'm going to remove your candlestick. And this, this really ought to hit home for this one really important thing. Because, I mean, all, they had a great report. You could be going to a church and there's activity going on, there's work, there's labor, they're, they're, they're identifying this false doctrines and false prophets and they're doing all of this stuff. It's like, man, this is great. They've got good doctrine, they've got good teaching, there's probably a lot, there's a lot of things going on at church. But they've, they've lost the first works and the first love. And God's willing to say, I'm not even going to consider you a church unless you get that right and get back to the first works. See, what happens in churches, especially as they grow, they got a lot of things going on, people are excited, they're motivated, doing things, you can kind of lose sight of what is it all about. What is the purpose? What is the goal? They still have some things that are good, right? Like they still have a, a good, you know, a purity for doctrine and they don't want to be corrupted by bad people and, and they're, they're on the lookout for that type of stuff. But... They lost sight of the first work. Now, what are the first works of the first love? I think very simply, it's preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. Winning souls to Christ. That is the first work. And I've got some places here. Turn, if you would, to John chapter 1. I've got some scriptural report, support to show you why I believe that the first works, the first works that people do is to bring people to Christ. I know, and this is anecdotal for myself, and I know that this may not apply to everyone in particular, but I know that for me, when I got saved, the first thing I wanted to do was tell other people that I got saved. And I'm not saying that because I think I'm such a great person or something. Look, there's many, many years where I was not right with God and I actually committed even worse sins after I was saved. But the point is that the night I got saved, the next morning, the first thing I did was tell my roommates that I got saved. And I couldn't explain it really well. I wasn't good at articulating it. I didn't have all the right terminology to explain it to them. But I, I told them that, hey, I, you know, I believe in Jesus. I accepted Jesus as my Savior. And I told them that. And that was the first thing that I did. And I told other friends and family, and I told people, hey, this happened. Why? Because it's a big deal. Because I got saved. And that's the first thing I wanted to just, just tell other people about it. Hey, G this is great. Jesus saved me. And this is something that you're going to see throughout Scripture, other people having that same reaction. In John chapter 1, I went over this a little bit on Wednesday night. I don't know if everyone heard the sermon Wednesday night because there's a little bit of an audio problem, but we got that figured out. I think we got it today. I was test, trying to test it all before service. Uh, verse number 40 in John chapter 1. This is when Jesus Christ is recruiting disciples. Okay? Verse number 40, it says, One of the two men which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. So Andrew hears uh, John, John the Baptist. And then it says, verse 41, he first findeth 
his own brother Simon and saith unto him, we have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. So when um, Andrew hears about, like about Jesus, because right? John the Baptist is pointing people to Jesus. And then he, he sees this like, oh man, so Jesus, he's the Christ, right? He realizes Jesus is the Christ. Now look, I've already said this on Wednesday night, and I believe that all these disciples, apart from Judas Iscariot, were already saved. They were already believers in the Lord. They already had been saved. But even though they didn't know the name of Christ, just like believers in the Old Testament got saved without knowing the name of Jesus Christ. But what, what's, what's interesting here is that as soon as they find out, hey, Jesus is the Christ, the first thing they do is they go and get other people and start telling them, hey, look, we found Jesus. This is Jesus. So this is what Simon, or excuse me, what Andrew does with Simon Peter, right? And everyone knows Apostle Peter. Well, Andrew's brother went and, and got him. It says, we found the Messiah, which is being interpreted to Christ, verse 42, and he brought him to Jesus. And when Jesus beheld him, he said, thou art Simon, the son of Jonah, thou shalt be called Cephas, which is by interpretation a stone. So that's what, Simon, or what Andrew does. He goes and gets his brother and says, hey, look, we found the Christ. Verse 43, the day following, Jesus would go forth into Galilee and findeth Philip and saith unto him, follow me. Now Philip was of Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip findeth Nathanael and saith unto him, we have found him of whom Moses and the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. So Philip does the same exact thing that Andrew does. He goes and finds somebody and says, hey, look, this is Christ. Look, we found the Christ. First thing they do, they go and find a loved one and go tell them about Jesus. In John chapter 4, we want to flip over to chapter 4, we see the same thing with the woman at the well. Same exact pattern. Verse number 25 in John chapter 4, the Bible reads, The woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. So she's looking for a Christ. She's looking for a Messiah. Verse 26, Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. So he reveals himself to her saying, Look, I am the Christ. I am the Messiah. That's me. And look at what you, now his disciples show up, verse 27, and upon this came his disciples and marveled that he talked with the woman, yet no man said, why, what speakest thou or why talkest thou with her? And then in verse 28, so right after he says, I'm the Christ, verse 28, the woman then left her water. She, let, she leaves what she's doing. She's there doing work. She's there going, you know, getting the water pot and bringing it back. And it says, she left her water pot, went her way into the city and said to the men, come see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? First thing, first work, go out and bring other people to Christ. Turn, if you would, to Luke chapter 13. And if you think about it, it makes sense that the first love, the first works, is going to be bringing people to Christ. I mean, those are just a couple examples of people actually acting that out and doing that. But what is... Your life as a Christian all about, if not being like Christ. And what did Christ do? He came to seek and to save that which is lost. He came to be a servant. He came to minister to others. He came to bring the gospel and get people saved. So if we're going to be, if we're supposed to be like Christ, if when we're born again, we get saved. Now our life is supposed to be patterning ourselves after Jesus' life. And we're supposed to do the things that Jesus did. I mean, it only makes sense that the most important thing is telling other people how they can have eternal life and be saved and change their lives forever. What is more valuable than that? What else can you possibly do with your life that is worth more than that? What work can you do that's going to be more valuable than, than changing the destination of someone else by <laughs> preaching the gospel unto them and them getting saved because you're going off and doing the work and telling them about Jesus Christ? It is extremely crucial that churches do this. The church has been entrusted with the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're the ambassadors that we go out in, in Christ's stead because he's now no longer physically on this earth preaching the gospel, that it's our job to go out and do that. And God's entrusted us with that job to go out and do that. And it makes sense, especially as we start seeing some of these other portions of Scripture, that God would remove your candlestick as a church. Hey, if you're not doing these first works, if you're not preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, if you're not actually producing fruit and bringing people to the Lord, then I'm not even going to consider you to be one of my churches. We're going to see other examples that support this in Scripture. In Luke 13, look at verse number 6. The Bible reads, He spake also this parable, A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came and sought fruit thereon and found none. 
Then said he unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down. Why cumbereth it the ground? So obviously what's going on here is that some guy's got a vineyard, and in, or, in, in a vineyard, you have trees that are supposed to be producing fruit for you, right? I mean, it's a whole point of having a vineyard and having trees because you want to get, reap the, the, the fruit of what you have planted. That's why people have gardens, right? You don't have a garden just to have it look pretty. You have a garden, I mean, a flower garden maybe, but you generally have, you have gardens, vegetables, things like that, because you want to get those vegetables. You want to get that fruit, right? You want to get the results of those plants. And when you've got this tree, and here, look, we've got this tree for three years, it just, it's not producing anything. Let's just get rid of it. Let's replace it. Let's replace it with a tree that's going to bring forth fruit. And then verse 8, it says, And he answering said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also, till I shall dig about it and dung it, and if it bear fruit well, and if not, then after that thou shalt cut it down. So he's basically saying, well, let's, let's give it a little bit more time. Let's be a little bit more long-suffering with this tree. Let's give everything that we can and, and do our best to try to help make this tree fruitful and productive. And once we've done everything we can do, then fine, let's just get rid of it and, and, and cast it away. Now, we saw earlier in Matthew 7 that Jesus is talking about prophets as being, you know, bearing fruit and knowing them by their fruit. And now we see here a parable about a fruit tree that's not bringing forth fruit, just basically being taken out and removed because it's not bearing fruit, lines up perfectly with a church that's not bearing fruit in bringing people to Christ and them being removed from their place. Turn, if you would, to Matthew 21. We see another example. And again, this is more of a parable. We'll get into more solid teaching after these parables, just more plain statements from the Scripture. But these parables um, do line up with the same exact concept. Matthew 21, verse number 18 the Bible says, Now in the morning as he returned into the city, he hungered. This is talking about Jesus. When Jesus came back in the city, he was hungry. And when he saw a fig tree in the way, he came to it and found nothing thereon but leaves only. And said unto it, Let no fruit grow on thee henceforward forever. And presently the fig tree withered away. And when the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How soon is a fig tree withered away? So Jesus comes to this tree. It's a fig tree. He's hungry. He's expecting fruit on it. He's saying, Well, what good are you? I came to you, I expect you to have fruit, and there's nothing there. And he says, you know what? Now you're not going to have any more fruit. I'm done with you. And it withers away. It's the same picture, the same concept. Turn if you go to John chapter 15, the same concept that we see. Look, when God's going to remove the candlestick, he's already given the churches space to repent. He's saying, you know what? Just like in the other parable, we're going to dung it. We're going to do all this stuff. We're going to try it out. I'm giving you this message. I'm giving you the warnings. I'm letting you know, hey, I love you. I care about you. You're doing these other great things, but you know what? You've got to get this right. You've got to repent because you know what? Otherwise, I'm going to yank that candlestick out of its place. And when God yanks the candlestick, you know, the people are still going to keep meeting. But from that point on, the Holy Ghost is not... Is not uh, working through that church anymore. I don't believe that. Because otherwise, what is it going to mean for him to remove the candlestick? He said, you know, I'm done working with you guys. I'm done using you as my laborers. Just go out. You, you want to do your own thing anyways and just go off and do your own thing. But as far as God's concerned, he's done with you. John 15, verse number 1. The Bible reads, I am the true vine and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit he taketh away. Now, this is talking about a branch. This is every branch in me. And it is important because this is about being in Christ. Right? So, again, a believer, someone who's saved, someone who is in Christ, but they're not bearing fruit, he says, you know what? God just takes them away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it that it may bring forth more fruit. The Bible teaches us that we are God's workmanship. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Right? Very famous passage. But then it says in verse 10, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. We're created to do good works. We're created to do especially the first works and the first love. 
It says, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Salvation's free. Salvation's a free gift. Salvation has nothing to do with your works. Salvation is something you receive of God freely, 100%. What Jesus did, I'm trusting Him. He paid my way. I'm born again. I'm a child of God because of Jesus, because of what He did. I'm just trusting Him. But from that point forward, you are created. You become this new person, this new creature unto good works. You're not there just to live off the rest of your years just in, in vanity and wasting your time in meaningless behavior of just doing essentially nothing of value, but He's created you to do good works. And He wants you to go bring forth fruit. He wants you to be productive for Him. And you read the other parables about the, about the kingdom of God and, and the rewards that He's going to be given. He's given people talents. He's, you know, you do this and you do this and you say, occupy till I come. And they go and, and they do all this work for the Lord and they're rewarded for it. But that's what God has planned for you as a believer is to be doing the works. And especially a church is a, a group of believers saying, look, I know you're doing some other things. You have these other programs and kids programs and music programs and every other program in the world. But if you don't have a soul winning program, you're going to lose your candlestick. If you don't care about the first most important things, reaching people with the gospel of Jesus Christ, you're not even a church in my sight. That's why for me, when I, when I judge churches, if I'm going to go on vacation somewhere, you know, or before I start pastoring a church, if I'm going to go and join myself to a church, one of the criteria, one of the, the things that has to be there on my list of things that has to be there is they have to be a soul winning church. Because if they're not doing the first works and if they're not involved in the first love, then what's going to make me think that they even have a candlestick in God's eyes? These are the things that we learn from these chapters, and this is why it's so important to go through these details and say, look, these are good things. If we want to be commended of God, then we should hate the people that are evil. We shouldn't tolerate and bear with them. And we should be able to expose false prophets, false apostles, people who are saying that they're a believer like us, and they're not. We need to be able to be smart enough to identify that. But most importantly, what we need even more than all those other things is something that's going to make us lose our candlestick is not having the first works and that first love. It has to be there. Now, God will work with us. He'll work with churches. He'll work with, you know, with His people. He's not just quick to just turn His back on you. But there is a point where He's going to say, you know what? Candlestick is gone. And you know what? It happens. And you know what happens to every church throughout history? Every church gets to that point. There's a degradation. There's no church still standing today from 2,000 years That's ago. It's just the same exact church, except for maybe the unholy Catholic church. I don't know. But, you know, there's no real church of God. And again, even those churches, you know, they, they, they get wiped out. I'm talking about just, just gatherings of people because people change, generations change, you know, whatever. And, and unfortunately, there's a sinful nature in, in mankind. And then there's also Satan targeting churches trying to destroy them and splinters churches and, and, and causes them to fall. Um, there's, a lot, there's a lot to look out for. But um, we'll close on this verse, Matthew 12, 30. You know, the turn there, the Bible says, He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. That's what Jesus said. He said, if you're not gathering with me, if you're not actually going out and doing the work for me, he's like, you're actually scattering. You're, actually, you're not just neutral and doing nothing. You're, you're, you're actually doing more damage. And I fully believe that it's possible that, that it happens that God, well, first of all, that God has a plan for everybody's life and God has work for you to do and God wants you preaching the gospel to people. He wants you telling other people about, about the love of Christ and about the gift that he has for you and for everybody. He wants us doing that. But if you just completely are stiff-necked and refuse and you don't want to have anything to do with it and you're this branch that's in Christ but you're not producing anything, God's going to be like, well, what, why, why you cumber you the earth? Why do I even have you here then? I'm just going to bring you home to be with me because you're not doing anything that I'm telling you to do there, so done. I believe that happens. And um, that's what's being taught here in Scripture. So let's, we're going to continue on this study tonight. We're going to look at uh, Smyrna tonight and we're going to see what we can learn from there. But um, I'm excited about this series. You know, take this to heart. 
There's a lot of great truths in, in the scripture here in the churches of Revelation. And if, you, if you're like me, you want to see our church thrive and, and grow and, and be used of God mightily and just be the, you know, the best church that we could possibly be, then we're going to seriously consider all of these uh, reports of these churches so that we can get the best of the best from what they were doing and, and make sure we're, we're not involved in any of the worst uh, of the bad things that, that the churches were involved with. As far as I have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for giving us the instructions that you've given us in Scripture. We're living in a time that we have so much at our disposal. We've got uh, your word perfectly preserved and perfectly available for us today so easily and readily that, that everybody can literally have a copy of your words in their pocket. And um, it's so convenient and so nice. But we know that unto whom much is given, much shall be required also. Lord, help us not to be negligent in our duties and responsibilities to preach the word. Help us to grow as a church. Help us to, to live righteously and do right and lead more people to you and that we would never lose our love and our focus of the first works. Uh, even in times that may be more challenging, God, help us to be stirred up in our spirit to, to do more to serve you. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.